And people might say, where? Where did we start seeing the Trinity in the Old Testament? I see it in the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter one, verse one. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, let's take that back into the Hebrew. It says, Elohim created. Elohim is the plural of God. It's God's. Hi, if you're new with us and this is your first time, we'd like to welcome you to the channel and welcome you to this series. If you're a returning viewer, we want to welcome you back as we are now going to be expanding the series on understanding the Godhead with short subjects. But before we get started, I want to make some clarifications. Today's subject is grounded in the four principles of understanding the Godhead. And I recommend that you first view these before you view the short subjects as they are based in the four principles. Now, you don't have to view the, the principles first, but I recommend that you view them as the principles are the foundational basis to the short subjects. The biblical basis in the principles is extensive and we won't be covering the basics again at that depth. So if it seems like the scriptures are sparse today, this is why. These short subjects will be solidifying the principles and I will be referencing the material covered in the respective principles. Today's lesson will cover the biblical title of God, Elohim. Trinitarian teachers love to reference this title of God in attempts to substantiate their doctrine from Rome. What they do with this wonderful title of God is almost a crime. Today, we will explore this title of God and discover its biblical view and usage. Now, back in principle number one, we did touch on the title Elohim, but we're going to go over it more in depth today. There are two ways that we'll look at this, and I hope to cover both. We're going to look at it intellectually, and we're going to look at it in a spiritual view. So let's get started with the intellectual view. We're going to look at this at face value. Elohim has two forms. Plural and plural intensive singular. Now, under the plural form, it is used to describe rulers, judges. It's used to define divine ones, angels, gods. And then in the plural intensive singular, it is used to describe God or goddess, godlike one, works or special possessions of God, and lastly, it is used to describe the true 
God. The Trinitarian philosophers like to point out with glee that since Elohim is a plural noun, it must mean that God is a trinity. They like to use this to rest their doctrine into the Old Testament. Now I'm going to ask the unasked question here. The Trinitarian teachers pounce on this plurality, telling us that it means three and not one. Well, why does it have to stop with three? Plural doesn't mean three, and not plural means one. Plural means more than one. They like to make you think it means three. Well, why not four or seven? or 18 for that matter. It just exposes their overt efforts to force this doctrine into the Bible. While their assessment is true that it is a plural noun, they decline to mention that it is also used in a singular sense. We have similar words in English that can mean both singular and plural. The way you tell the difference is by the context and the verbs used with it. For instance, if I own one sheep and I say, my sheep hears my voice, it is clear from the verb used that I only have one sheep. And if I own a flock of a thousand sheep and I say, my sheep hear my voice, it's now clear that I have more than one sheep. And of course, we've already seen through principle one, there's not more than one. There's not more than one. It's true that it is a plural noun, but their conclusion that it indicates a plurality in the Godhead is just deeply and fatally flawed. And someone that might not know their little tactic that they like to use here to prove it, if they're not ready for hearing something like that, it could trip them up because what they use is pretty compelling. And, uh, I mean, just look how many there are. It's supposed to be the orthodox teaching. And uh, just because it's orthodox doesn't mean it's right. Eight souls went on the ark. Everybody else didn't. The orthodoxy stayed behind on the beach. Eight souls were saved. So we have to have a standard to go to, and that's the Bible, naturally. Now, as you heard in the prologue today, you clearly heard how deceptive they can be. So the, the title or name Elohim was first used in Genesis 1.1. And it's the only name of God that was even mentioned in the first chapter of Genesis. No other name or title was given. Just Elohim. And that's because creation was going on. The Lord was establishing himself. Let's listen to that clip again. And people might say, where? Where did we start seeing the Trinity in the Old Testament? I see it in the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, let's take that back into the Hebrew. It says, Elohim created. Elohim is the plural of God. It's God's. As this was extensively covered in principle number one, let me remind you of something here. When Trinitarians define something in their doctrine, in their purview of the Bible and the doctrines they like to propagate, you got to remember that the Trinitarians have their own definitions, even though they use the same words someone else might use they have their own special definition of them. Let's first look at a book written by Levi Payne. This is a reference book, and it's called A Critical History of the Evolution of Trinitarianism. 
and it was first published in 1900. Quote, The Old Testament is strictly monotheistic. God is a single personal being. The idea that a trinity is to be found there is utterly without foundation. There is no break between the Old Testament and the New. The monotheistic tradition is continued. Jesus was a Jew, trained by Jewish parents in the Old Testament scriptures. His teaching was Jewish to the core. A new gospel indeed, but not a new theology. And he accepted his own belief the great text of Jewish monotheism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. End quote. With this in mind, let's compare what the Trinitarian promulgator says with the following definitions. But talking about the word Elohim, he says grammatically, it is a plural word used as if it were singular. Uh, the verbs and pronouns used with Elohim should be in the plural, but when Elohim is used, when it refers to the Lord God, capital L-O-R-D, which is Jehovah God, the verbs and pronouns are in the singular. So you begin to see the Trinity here that there's more than one person in the word Elohim. Elohim created. Elohim is the plural of God. It's God's. So let's compare what he just said with the definition of monotheism. Monotheism is the doctrine or belief that there is but one God. Let's listen to that clip again. It's God's. Okay, well, now let's look at the definition of polytheism, which is the belief in or worship of more than one God. That is to say, gods. Now let's listen to his clip again. It's gods. It's gods. It's gods. Polytheism is belief in or worship of more than one God. That is to say, Gods. What did he say? It's gods. Gods. It's gods. Gods. It's gods. In the Trinitarian world, they have their own lexicon, which says one does not equal one. Three does not equal three. Monotheism does not equal monotheism. Person does not equal person. Begotten does not equal begotten. Well, let's consider what Edmund Fortman wrote in The Triune God, A Historical Study of the Doctrine of the Trinity. Quote, The Old Testament tells us nothing explicitly or by necessary implication of a triune God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is no evidence in the Old Testament that any sacred writer believed in or suspected the existence of a trinity within the Godhead. Even to see in them suggestions or foreshadowings or veiled signs of the trinity of persons is to go beyond the words and intent of the sacred writers." End quote. The endless studies made in the past have more than established the fact that God is one and using and twisting the meanings of titles such as Elohim to imply God is something that he is not is dishonest at best and philosophical sophistry is more like what it really is. As it says in Malachi 2.10, uh, have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Guess what word that is there? Hath not one Elohim created us? One Elohim. One God, not a plurality. 
And it's used throughout the Hebrew Bible just like we use God in English. It's used for false gods and it's used for the true God. And some uses here in Judges 6.31, it talks about, will you plead for Baal? Will ye save him? It goes on to say that if he be a god, let him plead for himself because one hath cast down his altar. If he be an Elohim, and that has significance, which I will bring out here. Second Kings 1, 2, it talks about inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. Beelzebub, the Elohim of Ekron. So Elohim was used to describe these false gods. 1 Kings 11.33, and it talks about three of them. Because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, all those are Elohim. The writer used Elohim there. So all of these verses here use the same title for Baal, Beelzebub, Ashtoreth, Shemosh, Milcom. Every time these false gods are used, they used the word Elohim to describe them. Well, let's flip this right back on them now. Well, is there a trinity of Baal? Is there a trinity of Shemosh? Is there a trinity of Ashtoreth and Baal and Beelzebub? Are they trinities? They don't tell you about that. They only want you to focus on the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord Jehovah, our God. Elohim is one Lord. Well, Elohim there is plural, so it must talk about the Trinity. Well, then Ashtoreth is a Trinity, and all these other gods are Trinity. How foolish do they think we are to fall for something as shallow as that? Praise God. There were prophecies that spoke directly about Jesus in the Old Testament. That's where we're sort of camping out here. Uh, that also used the title Elohim. In Zechariah 11, we set the, the context here in verse 4, where it says, Thus saith the Lord my God, feed the flock of the slaughter. The Lord, Jehovah my God, Elohim. Thus saith Jehovah my Elohim. He's talking here in this portion of Scripture. And so we drop down to the 11th and 12th verses, and it's still Jehovah Elohim speaking. And he said, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Hmm, I wonder who that's talking about. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was priced at of them, and I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Was there a trinity sold for thirty pieces of silver? No, no, there wasn't. It's clearly a reference to Jesus and not to a trinity somewhere. Three chapters later, Zechariah also wrote something else that God would do. And note that it would also be done uh, in the name of Elohim. In Zechariah 14.5, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah the king of Judah. And the Lord my God, Elohim, shall come, and all the saints with thee. Now are three people coming back? Three persons coming back? The answer is a resounding no. 
course, three aren't coming back. And the reason we can be so positive about this is because that's exactly the way Paul said it would be in 1 Thessalonians 3.13, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Praise God. It is clear that Elohim is not referring to a plurality of gods in the Godhead or persons or personalities or however they want to uh, describe it. There is not a plurality. So since the plural noun Elohim does not indicate a plurality of persons, you might be asking yourself, well, then what does it mean? I'm glad you asked. Praise God. And this is where we cross over into the spiritual meaning of it. That was all intellectual headbanging there. Anybody could do that and put these all together and see that. But now we want to get behind the spirit of why the Lord used Elohim instead of just God. Or like in uh, the Shema, why would he throw Elohim in there and then use the Hebrew word Echad for one, which can be a compound one. Uh, You know, like if you say, I've got a dozen eggs, one dozen eggs, you'd use the word Echad. But if it was only one thing, like there's only one pencil on my desk, you could use the word Yahid, which means only one. So why did he use Yahid in the Shema? Why did he use Echad, which kind of gives an open door to these guys to reverse engineer these scriptures to their doctrine, saying, well, it's a compound unity. So we're going to look at what this is from a spiritual sense. What is the spirit behind this? And in the Old Testament, God has lots of titles. He has lots of names. And these names and titles are given to us to reveal his nature, to reveal his attributes, to talk about him, to let us know what he is like and what he can do and what he is capable of. And there's lots of titles that tell us something about him and describe him. Oh, boy. I I wish I could go into this Trinitarian three-card Monty that they're playing with these scriptures to try to do this, but we're going to stay on course here. All the titles convey something to God about him to us, like Jehovah Shalom and Jehovah Raphi, Jehovah Jireh, El Shaddai. All these different titles tell us something that he has mercy, he has righteousness, he is judgment, he's a provider, he's a healer, he's the almighty, he's a shepherd. There's always a title that describes it, uh, especially it might be in the moment that he's talking that he brings this out and see I'm a shepherd to you, see I've been a captain in battle to you, see I've been the almighty to you. So we have a finite mind, and God is naturally infinite. And it's hard to grasp everything that God is because he's just so great. He's so large. He's so mighty. And it's kind of hard for humans to process all this. And that's why he gives us all these, if you want to call them hints, he tells us what he is through these titles. So if all these names and titles have specific meanings, then what does Elohim convey to us? What does it convey? At the core of the name Elohim is the root word El. Elohim is the plural of El. And El simply means power. 
It means power. And that root word is used all over the place in the Semitic world and in the, the writings that they've had. And we've already seen a little bit of that in some of the scriptures we just read about Baal. Baal, there's El. Uh, Baalzebub. El is used there. And it, it's just showing that, yep, these are false gods And, of course, they're both called Elohims as well in the scriptures. So we want to look at the setting where the first scriptures were written about God. And in the ancient world, the ancient Greeks, the ancients from way, way back, they didn't have all the modern science that we have today. And that's why people would worship the sun They would worship fire, they'd worship water, they'd worship whatever they could worship because they figured there was an L behind each of these elements or each of these powers, if you want to call them that. And so basically they associated a power or an L to everything that they experienced and saw. And of course none of these powers had anything to do with each other in their mind because they they didn't have all the science we have today. And they were all independent and had their own God. If you wanted, you know, if you were a heathen and you wanted some rain, you'd pray to the cloud gods. And if it was raining too much, you'd pray to the sun god. And you would pray to this god and that god. But you couldn't get them. You'd have to go all over the place. You look at the ten plagues of Egypt, and you can see God was breaching those beliefs because if you go into the study there, all of those plagues that God sent on the Egyptians were against their gods. They had a God for each of those things that God sent a plague against, showing that your God doesn't have any power here. And then when they came to the seventh plague, that was really something. The seventh plague was the plague of hail. But we think of hail when there's a bad storm with big white ice things on the ground. This hail was a little different. It was mixed with fire. And that's what was blowing Pharaoh's mind. It's how can the God of fire and the God of ice or water be cooperating here with this hail of ice and fire on my country? And he briefly Step back and say, okay, well, there, yeah, you, you do have a true God there. He's in control, but God hardened his heart, and you know the story. So to the Jews, all these powers that are manifested in the world, the plurality of powers, all come from one source, and that's God. God created everything. We're still in the first chapter of Genesis here. He's in creation, and he made all these things, all these different things that that man could, well, there's power in that. uh, But he says, no, I'm behind all this. I'm the one that did all this. I'm the God of power. I'm the God that's almighty. I'm the creator. I made all these things the plurality of all these things. When he made the sun, Elohim did that. When he made all the animals, Elohim did that. When he made all the vegetation, everything, Elohim was behind all of that. He was the one that did it. And it all came from him. Everything you see is from God, from Elohim. And they are not independent agents. You come back to the one that made them. You come back to God because he is the one that brought them forth. He's the one that made them. Another reason God does it this way is that when you see all these different powers, you don't worship them. Worship the one that brought them. He is the one. And, and we, we have gone over this scripture in the New Testament when we're talking about the Godhead 
It's clearly seen from the things that are created and everything. We're without excuse. You read a little bit down further in, in there in verse 25, it talks about how they changed the truth into a lie and worshipped the creation instead of the creator. Forget you, Elohim. I'm going to the sun. Soul Invictus. He's the mighty God that shines down on us. He doesn't want that, and that's why he is wanting our worship. We worship the creator and not the creation. And it's so offensive and so dirty to hear when Trinitarians would take the very verse and the very name that tries to bring us to a oneness a singleness of God into a plurality of gods. It's just the opposite what they're trying to do of what God is saying in his name and in this title. There we go, 180 degrees out of phase again. Whenever the devil's involved with his lies, you can rest assured it's 180 degrees away from the truth. We're going to look at one more because I got this other thing I want to get through, I hope. Another example of Elohim being used is when God called Moses. You know the, the, the deal. You know the story. He was out in the back 40. He saw the burning bush. He approached the burning bush, and God spoke to him. And to make the long conversation short, he says, I want you to deliver my people. And Moses said, oh, no, no, God, I can't. I, I'm not able. I'm not equipped I'm, I, I just can't do it. I can't talk. I, I'm not your man. I'm not your man. I can't. But let's look what God said to Moses. In Exodus 7-1, And the Lord said unto Moses, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, is going to be your prophet. I have made you an Elohim to Pharaoh. God would tell Moses what to do, and Aaron would be his prophet, his spokesman, and say exactly what was supposed to happen. And then we see further on down, Exodus 11, 3, that that was fulfilled. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt and in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So since Moses was called Elohim, do we have three Moseses? It's just so ridiculous, the argument that they try to bring saying, oh, it means there's a trinity, there, there's got to be a plurality. The Jews have used this title Elohim ever since the scriptures have been written. They've never had a problem with it. They don't have a problem, and they aren't going to be tricked by the shell game that they're playing with these scriptures, because they're only going to show you the ones, like the verses with the word one, that talk about, oh, see, there's a compound unity. Man and woman shall become one flesh. That's a compound unity. And they cherry pick all these verses. See, see, it's a compound unity. And so when the Lord our God is one Lord, Ichad, that's a compound unity. He must be a trinity. And it so, sounds so convincing, but to me it sounds so ridiculously filthy and just so they certainly never implied by using this that there was a plurality of gods or persons or personalities in the Godhead. And I find it that it's just so arrogant for them to think that they can come to the Jews and tell them what their language means. <laughs> I mean, it's just ridiculous. God is far greater in power and majesty than a singular noun is capable of describing. It's just as simple 
as that. I hope you were blessed by this lesson today. The Lord wants to reveal himself to all, but you will have to be willing to let go of any preconceived ideas and teachings you may have. The truth is found in the Bible alone. Let the scriptures speak to you and bring you into the truth of God. Traditions may come and go. Men and teachers will come and go, and their man-made doctrines will fade as the grass. But the word of God is forever established and will never change. Put yourself upon the rock of the Bible and get off the sinking sand of men's doctrines and commandments. There will be more short subjects coming soon that you will not want to miss. Subjects like the pre-existent Christ, let us make man, the baptism of Jesus, the plan of God, and much more. You know the deal. Subscribe and you won't miss out on the latest video lessons. And click on the bell to be notified when a new video gets released. Until then, may the Lord bless you and lead you on your path to truth.